Oh yeah, good. Thank you. Recording. To have April here talking about trade, immigration, and uh, intergenerational occupational mobility and equality. We go for an hour, and then we'll have time for more questions and comments at the end. The uh, house rules are: if you have a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask, uh, and then you know we, we can have uh, further discussion at the end. Uh, go ahead and take it away. You've got an hour. Thank you, Kim and George, for having me here. Um, so this is a joint work uh, with my student Yan Hua Xu. So the idea um, was totally hers. So she wanted to ask. Um, she her goal um, is to study intergenerational occupational mobility, and. Uh, uh, she wants to study th this topic in um, open economy framework because most of the time um, people study occupational mobility in a closed economy. And since, um, so her, her motivation, if we go to the slide, uh, is that from her observation for, for kids in her cohort, um, most of those who have left her hometown, which is uh, Tianshui in Gansu province, um, changed an occupation from their parents. However, the other kids who stayed in her hometown um, kind of uh, kept the same occupation as their parents. So she thought maybe this immigration barrier is the thing that prevent um, people from um, moving across different occupations. And then, however, there are um, other factors such as um, um, skill uh, transmission between generations. So my father say is a worker in a steel company and maybe I learned something from, from him. So I'm more likely to stay in the same occupation. So in, in the same word framework, when we do counterfactual analysis, we can actually study uh, which one is more effective, whether reducing the immigration barrier or um, reform the education system so that all kids from different family background are going to um, learn um, exactly the same skill distribution. So yeah, this is one of the so this is basically her idea. So to see if reducing immigration barrier can help promoting occupational mobility. Um, and then, um, cause in 2019, yeah. So the year before this pandemic, um, China had this education reform that banned all, uh, what's that, after school, academic um, what's that? academic courses. So um, all the private schools after school hours, can they cannot operate. They can teach dancing or sports, but they cannot teach anything about academic courses. So the goal, they wanted to reduce the, uh, the economic burden on parents. Um, however, that also has, uh, on the same time, it kind of, uh, they try to give equal uh, uh, education resources to, to all family, to kids from all families. So, um, and that's, so, and then there are other micro level uh, experiments in the poor regions in China, they try to, uh, and I think those are targeting um, early childhood kids to see if those early childhood intervention can uh, promote their um, academic achievements when they grow up. But also those sort of um, education reforms um, are trying to kind of um, reduce inequality. They want to see if um, those um, kind of um, input can help poor kids to, um, to grow better. Um, but those are kind of micro level, uh, not uh, studying the, the, the aggregate effect of education reform. 
And I think our framework is exactly in the right position to study the, the macro consequences of education reform. And especially um, what we found was um, the education reform that allocate equal resources to all children um, doesn't actually um, reduce inequality. So then the question is, what, uh, what are the differences between open economy framework and the closed economy framework? Because in the closed economy, that's going to, the education reform is going to reduce inequality. However, that's not true in the open, um, open economy. So the, the model, so when Yanhua came to me, um, she told me her idea, um, I just uh, give her and this HHJK and the uh, Ji Ting's paper. And also uh, another Tongbi and the Jews um, paper with trade and immigration. So she basically set um, this occupational choice model, ROI model into um, trade, um, a multi-regional trade and immigration framework. And then the, the data that we use to um, estimate immigration costs, excuse me, are the mini population census. Um, this one uh, is using the HUCO information. Um, so basically we know the parents' age, income, occupation, and, um, and the location, and also the kids, um, the same information for the for their children, as long as the children is still registered in the same hukou. Mm. However, this um, data has a problem because for um, kids who moved to a different city and who have obtained their own hukou, then we lose track of them. That's it's especially a problem for high skilled kids because they are more likely to obtain a hukou in their new city. So we supplement the information using family panel studies um, data. So this one is not restricted by the hukou registration, but it has a much smaller number of observations, but, but it's better than that. And then in the end, after we calibrate the model, we run four counterfactual experiments. Um, basically to see which one is able to give us the highest uh, occupational mobility and which is more likely to reduce inequality and increase welfare. Um, so the, the most striking one is the education reform, say, because uh, when we calibrate the data, we see that um, kids from high income, um, high income occupation parents are more likely to uh, to draw high skill high skills in those um, high income occupations so kind of that's an inequality at born because of this the random skill draw and then in the education reform we just basically make all children to draw from the same exante skill distribution it does give us the largest welfare gain, but uh, inequality-wise, is the is the highest among all the um, in, um, counterfactuals, even higher than the baseline. Um, because um, so, when all children have similar skills in all occupations, that means they are indifferent when choosing occupation. And the, the elasticity of labor supply is actually much higher than the baseline. Um, so in every occupation, uh, the workers are going to um, flood into, into the uh, sector that the region has comparative advantage. So that means this uh, more elastic labor supply enlarges every region's comparative advantage. So that's good for trade and welfare gain. However, that's not good for inequality because the 
The driving force of income differences in China is the productivity differences across region and the sectors. And this education reform literally magnifies the productivities or the comparative advantages across regions. So education reform alone is not going to um, do anything good to inequality. And then uh, trade liberalization, uh, this is what happened exactly as uh, the, the result is exactly what we have uh, expected. So um, and it's not good for inequality. So basically, um, trade is going to reinforce the comparative advantage of every region. Um, so the children from parents who work in the RCA sectors, um, they are more likely to inherit the same occupational skill from their, their parents. So, and then they are going to stay in the same sector or the same occupation. So they basically inherit the human capital and the income of their parents. So we see a reduction in uh, inequality and occupational mobility. So in all those kind of inequality measures. Um, yeah, I think these are the explanations. And then for immigration, um, it does give us the highest um, outcome in on the, the best outcome in inequality. Because workers now can move to wherever region um, that give, uh, gives them the highest return to their comparative advantage of skills. Um, however, it it does not necessarily uh, increase occupational mobility because there are two types of uh, interregional movers. One type, um, they will change an occupation from their parents. And then the other, the others are going to keep the same occupation because after all, kids are more likely to inherit the same um, um, human capital um, vector from as their parents. And then um, so they are still better off to stay in the same occupation as their parents. But now when the immigration barrier is lower, they can move to another region only to match with firms that are more productive. So this kind of, this type of immigration actually, actually reinforces income differences. So, uh, what the result from immigration reform um, doesn't, it doesn't give us, um, it doesn't show that by reducing immigration barrier, we can promote occupational mobility. And then the literature, I think I have mentioned, um, on the occupational mobility side, we basically borrowed the setting in Jiting's paper. And then on the trade immigration side, we are using Tom and the, and the Drew. Okay. So if you don't have questions, I'm moving on to the model. So we have eight Chinese regions plus rest of the world uh, and six occupations. Yeah, the, the Chinese data, we have um, very bad occupation and data. So we didn't use 31 provinces. Uh, we combined them into eight regions because otherwise there will be too many zeros in the immigration um, probability of immigration matrix. So even with eight regions, there are a lot of zeros of uh, immigration flows. Because there are eight regions and six occupations. So it, it will be 68 by 68 matrix, and we still see a lot of zeros. 
And every individual lives for two period, so young and old. Um, and when they are young, they, they go to school and accumulate their human capital. When they are old, they work. Um, so F and I is the share of population working in region N, uh, occupation I. So when they are young, um, okay, so we kind of classify all the workers um, who, who were born in region N, whose, par whose uh, father works in occupation I, and this worker decides to move to region M working in uh, occupation J. So we kind of label this worker as type NIMJ. So this worker's human capital depends on the school time investment and um, monetary expense E. So, and the worker is, there is uh, an interest-free student loan system. So the worker uh, can borrow from the student loan and then pay back the student loan when he is old and working. So the skill draw of this worker in- so Just one question here. So at they're in the first part of their life, they're gonna be doing the schooling and then they're gonna be working in the second part of their life. I mean, this, yeah. this schooling time, how do I think about that given that they're not gonna be working? There's not like a trade-off between time spent in schooling and time spent working. Mm -hmm. There is a trade-off between leisure and studying. If you don't study, you enjoy leisure. Yeah. So basically this time thing is just capturing sort of a utility cost. There's gonna be a monetary cost and a utility cost. Yes. I think we just, everything is copied from HHJK originally. Um, so this um, skill draw, human capital, in occupation J um, depends on father's occupation. So if father occupation is I, then this, uh, the likelihood that you get a draw higher than A depends on TIJ. So which is the strength of human capital intergenerational tra transmission. So, we're gonna see this TIG is very like asymmetric. And so basically kids from parents whose occupation, occupational income is higher, they are going to draw a much higher TIJ in the other um, high income occupations. And theta governs the dispersion. So we are particularly interested in estimating TIJ. And now the, mm, so with income, the income is um, wage rate times your, your skill times human capital. And then mu IJ is the net income out of immigration cost. The net income is spent on uh, paying back your student loan and then on goods. So this is the utility function of this type of worker. Yeah, you see this is, uh, so this is the leisure, one minus uh, schooling time. And then this is the utility from consumption. I think there is a simplification of this, um, uh, this, where is it? this human capital accumulation function so that this uh, schooling time is occupation specific. So it only depends on phi j. Yeah, we can estimate phi j using uh, the information on the years of education by every occupation in the data. And then, yeah, we can calculate the optimal education in expenditure, okay, optimal consumption, and then um, sub, uh, kind of um, substitute this E and C and S back to the utility function here to calculate the indirect utility of all type of workers with their skill draws. And then, 
sorry, sorry, can we just slow down a bit? So I'm confused. So, so I have, um, can you go back to the previous slide? This one? Yeah. So I have this utility function, um, mm -hmm. and then I've got to choose my, um, schooling time to maximize my utility subject to my budget constraint and leave the sort of the consumption yeah, yeah. to Here. one side. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so then you go to the next slide. So then you jump to there's some optimality condition, which says that the schooling, the optimal amount of schooling only depends on the occupation. What assumption yeah. buys you that? Because uh, um... You see, this is this uh, schooling time's contribution to human capital is JE specific, occupational specific. So I choose, I choose simultaneously. I'm going to choose um, what occupation I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose where I'm going to go, and I'm going to choose um, my schooling um, all simultaneously. Or there's kind of like a two stage thing where uncertainty is realized. Stage. Two stage thing. So you it's basically the kids is calculating all the possibilities of uh, J and M and calculate. So so basically this kid has to calculate the indirect utility of every M and J, and then find the best one. But before choosing the best one, he calculate all the possibilities. Yeah. Okay. Suppose I want to be a lawyer. Suppose I want to be a professor, and and then cal calculate all the indirect utilities, and then and so th it. they're choosing their occupation, and then you know they're going to get their schooling, and then in the next period, then they're going to choose where to go. Yeah. So it's like a backward, backward induction thing. Yeah. So. Yeah, this is nothing new. This is something copied from HHJK. It's just um, make it into two generations. In HHJK, they have, um, there is only one generation, but one people can live for three periods and then you can change an occupation between periods. But here is just two generations. And then, so yeah, uh, yeah, from here, we can calculate the possibility that children from region N, parent occupation I, uh, choose region M and occupation J. So, because sorry, we can... I, the, sorry to keep jumping in. I think <laughs> I skipped some assumptions about the mobility cost. Where is that? Have you shown that yet, or are you going to show that? Yeah, this that's new. This one, this thing, um, the this is a net income share. One minus mu is the immigration cost. And then we can solve this analytically because of the Fourier distribution assumption. And yeah, with this P, we can we have the data. We can match the data with the model moments to estimate this mu and T and others. With other moments, of course. I have a small question. Mm -hmm. in, in looking at the choices that are made in terms of their higher education, mm -hmm. in many in many families in China, doesn't mm -hmm. the father actually have a very large role in choosing where, uh, if it's his son, his son chooses to go to school? I think so. But first, you know, here has a role of this, your human capital skill draw is a random one. Although it depends on father's occupation, see we have we assume it depends on father's occupation I, but still it's random. And then, uh, so they they're gonna calculate. Yeah, we we simplified a simplified a lot of things. So basically, father's income only works through this TIJ. Yeah, nothing other than this TIJ. Of course, if you have a rich father, you can do a lot of choice. You have many options open. But perhaps, here, perhaps, perhaps I was unclear. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mean in terms of the father's income, but the mm -hmm. father's 
instructing the child where oh, he okay. has chosen for his child to go to school, which okay. I've noticed in a number of families. Okay, you mean schooling, choice of schooling time. Okay, okay, I got you. Um, here, yeah, here we just assume you choose the optimal schooling time to maximize your, your cost and benefit in human capital accumulation. Yeah, the, what you are saying is um, um, your children's schooling time is in parents' utility function. Is that what you mean? Right. I, I mean, I've seen many yeah. situations where the choice of higher education is not made by the child, but by the parent. <laughs> I know, but but if that's true, then the schooling time of their children must be in the parents' utility function, right? And I prefer my okay. kids to go, to, right? But, but here we don't have that. Yeah, here. I guess the question is whether there's some agency conflict between the parent and the child. But then you'd have to be. Uh, I mean, uh, Paul mm -hmm. would have to be more specific about how he thinks that enters mm -hmm. into, because. Um, that's, that's um, unclear if parents are biased towards one thing or the other. I know. Then you could put something in. Oh, yeah, I think to, to have something like uh, what uh, Paul has said, we need, um, yeah, we need to add this choice of schooling into parents' preference. But, but if we want to actually solve this, if we want to have an analytical probability of immigration, then we cannot do as things as complicated as that. You know, this, um, in our system, kids are completely independent. They pay off their own education expense. They choose their occupation and the region. The, the only thing that they inherit from their parents is their human capital and like the, the talent draw, right? In, the parents can only influence their kid. Uh, okay, and um, also the location of their parents because the immigration barrier is huge. Their parents, if their parents choose to stay in Shanghai, then it's uh, much easier for them to, to work in Shanghai than kids from Gansu. Yeah, it's only the location and parent occupation that affect children children's location and occupational choice. Yeah. Oh. Okay, yeah, this one is kind of the ideal situation where parents don't impose their ideology, their utility function over children's. Yeah, so we can solve this um, probability of immigration. Let me see the time. Okay. And then with that, um, in the if the labor market is in equilibrium, then the distribution of worker um, in the next generation should depend on the distribution of worker in the previous generation. Uh, time the the immigration matrix, and then if the economy is in steady state, then the two should be equal. Okay, then we have um, yeah. If we aggregate things up, we can have human capital in every region and occupation, because this phi comes from the the probability um, no, no, the yeah with this pig we can calculate the distribution of of talent for worker for every type of workers and then we aggregate them up to calculate mm, the distribution of uh, skill draw in every region occupation and then we can aggregate up the in net income, total consumption expenditure in every region on every good. And then on the trade side, it's totally EK. Um, in every, we have 
I think we have eight, eight sectors. Um, uh, agriculture, mining, there are two manufacturing sectors uh, and uh, two, two service sectors. Um, we, we will go to there. And in every, in every sector, there are um, many varieties that, uh, variety of intermediate inputs uh, that we can substitute from. And then, yeah, here the production uh, to produce those intermediate inputs. Um, this uh, intermediate good producers have to combine workers of those six occupations. So this gamma J G is the share of um, is the the income share of occupation J in sector G. So there is no capital, and then. There are only six types of occupations of, so human capital is the only input in the production of intermediate inputs. And then um, in every region in sector G, they have a productivity or the baseline productivity, A and G. And then the actual productivity of the firm is a for shade distribution. So this is our, uh, this is the standard EK assumptions. Um, then we have also inherited the results from EK, the price level. So this is the price that um, uh, the input from region N, uh, yeah, to region M in good sector G, this is the price. And then we have the probability that, or the share of, mm, share of total import from region M, no, 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 from region N to sold to region M in good sector G. Okay, then we can aggregate up to have uh, final good price um, this is kind of the revenue, total revenue of region N sector G. And then we can uh, figure out how much of the total revenue is given to human capital, to workers in occupation J sector G, <laughs> okay, okay. Um, yeah, and then we can aggregate up by region sector occupation, by region occupation, and then balance of trade. Those are the equations to close up the model. And then the equilibrium, uh, every, in, in, in general equilibrium, everybody is doing the optimization. Okay, so to measure welfare, we aggregate up um, workers from all the regions and occupations and different origins. And we measure inequality using Thale index. Um, the Thale index doesn't have an analytic solution. We have to use the, the MATLAB to kind of approximate. And then we also decompose this, the total Thale index by region and occupation to see where the, the change comes from. Okay, so, so any questions for the model? So here, this the utility that you're plugging in is the utility that has like that schooling cost and everything. It's like an ex ante, yeah. okay. Yeah, expected, yeah. Yeah, I think the, um, I've talked about this mini population census. It gives us um, the, the information about the parents. And I, see, I think here we only use the father because the father is more likely to, to work than the mother. So we have the father occupation and the, the children's occupation, income, year of education, location, age. I think those are important things. 
um, yeah, we use the customer data to know the regional trade with rest of the world. Uh, I think this geographic data is to is used to estimate regional trade cost. And then and regional input output table tell, tell us the, the trade flows between re Chinese regions. And then use STAN database to estimate consumption shares. Okay, so so the yeah, it's better to see the map. We divide China into eight regions. So this is Gansu, where Yanhua is from. I'm from Hebei, and my hometown is here. So Shanghai is here. And then eight sectors, yeah, agriculture, mining, two manufacturing index, uh, uh, industries. And, okay, this is kind of a utility, construction, also trade, transportation, yeah, and other services. Six occupations. We rank them by average income, principal, clerks, professional technicians, manufacturing, transportation, equipment operators, service personnel, farmers. So, so I think at that time, about six, sixty percent of parents are farmers. Yeah, this is uh, the map, and then the target. Targeted moments, because we, we need to estimate regional productivity by sector, the intergenerational uh, transmission of um, human capital matrix, effective wage, um, this net income share. Uh, we're targeting the trade shares, conditional income by father and the son occupation, conditional income by sons, regional, region occupation, immigration probability, uh, population distribution and human capital distribution by region occupation. Also Chinese GDP share in the world, I think is 6% per, 6 at 2005. Just a um, question here. So this muse is sort of like a tax, um, or one minus a tax that you pay in order to move across sectors or to move across um, occupation. So it's kind of like occupation. So it's like a, it's a monetary cost in some sense. But then in the data, it's sort of when you see somebody's income, you're counting that that's their income inclusive of this cost. Okay. Um, yeah, you can, because in, in China, uh, the Hukou registration. So in Shanghai, half of those people are, they don't have Hukou in Shanghai, basically. And then their kids, uh, their kids can go to public school, but they, they cannot choose which one. And then uh, some of them, they don't have Medicare. They pay the full amount of medical expenses. So Shanghai is already kind of much better than other regions. In some regions, your kids cannot go to, oh, Shanghai, your kids can go to the public school until grade nine. So you cannot go to high school in Shanghai because you, in, in Shanghai, the, the college entry exam is much easier than other provinces. So it's kind of an, a, privilege to to go to to take the exam in Shanghai yeah that's it's like if you want to stay in Shanghai after high school you go to some um, trade schools like you, you can be it's not it's kind of considered as inferior as high school because yeah I guess are, it's sort of two things here one is sort of the the form which this cost is assumed to take in the model and second is how the model mm -hmm. is mapped to the data. I guess I'm sort of just okay. wanted to know about the model that is mapped to the data. That's, mm -hmm. you know, you, what you see in the data, you're adding up things that are sort of gross oh, of this mu, and then you back it out mm -hmm. um, by, use it, by observing the flows, presumably what this sort of wedge, which reduces the real income for the people 
-hmm. must be. So when we match the moment, we are choosing before there is no mu in the equation. So the, this is the, the income we see in the data and there is no mu. The, yeah, you can say the mu is kind of the utility cost. But it's sort of like proportional because this, you, you have, you've put it in as it being proportional yeah, I, to income. So it's gonna, yeah. you know, that's gonna distort people's choices in a particular way, which it wouldn't yeah. do if it were, I don't know, maybe there's a different way to write it. Well, you, you can think of, um, say, um, even if I, my kid cannot go to public school, I can spend money and send her to a private school or international school, which is extremely costly. And that's a kind of a monetary cost for me to stay in Shanghai. And also the medical expenses, and then also, if you don't have a Shanghai hukou, you cannot buy a house in Shanghai. And then you see the asset value is increasing and you don't have that opportunity to own that asset. It's, those are all kinds of monetary cost. Yeah. That's the, 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 the international school is, is horrible in Shanghai. It's more just a question of, you know, yeah. how, I know, I know. given the form, what's the best way to match it to the data? So I was just curious about that. Mm, I know, but uh, let me see what's the definition of I. You see, I here is before the immigration cost. And then, and then here, our target, our target don't have that mu, right? Yeah, I, I know the mu is kind of affecting the choices through income. You were saying we should put it in front of the utility, something like that. I mean, I don't know. I just was trying to understand where, where you know, does the, is the, does the mu show up in this eye or not? It's like when you're, when you're counting things up, you know, mm -hmm. where does it, you know, given that it, the form seems to be some monetary cost, does it show up in like the resource constraint of this economy or where is, is this mm -hmm. like I, I need to produce something and then I pay something and somebody gets money for you know those services that I bought? Um, in the resource, let me see. In the resource. They got the wage. I think in the resource, there is no mu here. See, they pay the wage. I think it's only, it's like something, it's like a tax for those people without a hukou. And then it's given to international schools and the hospitals. Okay, and where are we? Okay, so so these are. I, I have a different question, which is, um, you showed us, but I wasn't focused on that at the time. How much? What's the time period of your data? Around two thousand five. Oh, okay, so it doesn't capture the trend towards people getting more educated. So it the does. reason why I'm asking is that if it does, then you would get, uh, I, I'm taking a little bit of issue at the Cobb Douglas assumption, because mm -hmm. if uh, the high skilled occupations are getting more and more filled uh -huh. from Cobb Douglas, you'd have to have their wages go down, which is probably not what's going on. No, the production function, not the, the workers. Oh, oh, okay, okay. In the production function, if there are mm -hmm. more bodies in the skilled occupation, because mm -hmm. production is called Douglas, you're going to have their wages go down. Well, but there's mm, skill bias, technological change. <laughs> Actually, we so see then, this, Yeah, yeah, you yeah, have to have the <laughs> technology change yeah, yeah. or some yeah, type yeah. of an elasticity greater than one of substitution. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'll, the I'll model is you static. <laughs> yeah. The model is especially static. if you have only a few years, you're not going to have a problem with the data anyway. Yeah, I think the the universities uh, kind of started doubling up their uh, admission since two thousand, no, since nineteen ninety five, when I when I went to college, I think, and then they later increased the admission a lot. 
And then, yeah, so this is the share of the wage share of in of each occupation in every sector. We just estimated using the wage share in the data. And then, so this is the, these are the data, not the parameters of the model. I just want to give, it, give you guys an idea. Intergenerational occupational mobility. So, mm, yeah, you see the high income parents, their kids kind of are more mobile. They can, they are more likely to enter into those high income professions. And this is a regional mobility. So basically they're more likely to stay their home region. And especially for those rich regions, the East and the South coast, you're already in a very good region. You want to stay there. And then, so this is the thing, the TIJ is the intergenerational transmission of, non, of uh, skills. So, so you see if the father so father's occupation has, um, has high income, then their kids are more likely to draw, um, no, no thing. yeah, to draw a high skill in other high skill income, high, high income occupations. But for, for those whose father is a farmer, then you see their likelihood to draw a high skill draw in the high income occupation is kind of very little. Yeah, this is kind of the inequality at born. And then, so we also estimate this new NIMJ, but we aggregate it up by kind of occupation pair and uh, by region pair. So they kind of make sense because the uh, diagonal elements are much larger than the off diagonal ones. And the trick cost estimation, for, we are following Tongbi and the Zhu. Uh, and then the trade cost by sector makes sense because the goods sector uh, trade cost is much smaller than the service sector. Okay, and then if we look at the model versus uh, data um, moments, they kind of uh, match very well. So, and then this is the trade share, I think. Okay, so now we, if we go to the counterfactuals, we have four sets of them. The first one, education reform, we kind of remember the TIJ is asymmetric. We just make it, fill it with equal numbers for all the IJ elements, which is the average number of the estimated TIJ. And then trade liberalization, we reduce the trade cost, the regional trade cost. So this is not like China joining WTO. This is like um, China building um, national wide, um, like a highway system or uh, this high speed train system that reduce uh, interregional trade cost within China. And then immigration reform that reduces cross regional immigration costs by 39%, which is equal to eliminating hukou restriction. And then the last one is combining two and the three together. Okay, so um, if we only look at occupational mobility, so this between occupation, between region, and then the first one is between occupation and the region. So in the baseline, we do see that um, if you already move across region, then you are very likely to change an occupation, the conditional probability of changing an occupation. And then, so the, the education reform, remember, exempted all kids draw from the same skill distribution. They draw ex, uh, exposed, there are still heterogeneity, but exempted, they are the same. You see trade increased 
um, tremendously, and the welfare increased like eight times more. So that means um, basically kids, they are, you see, they are more like, much more likely to change occupation within the region, between occupation, but they don't really move across the region, you see, because between, because within the home region, they, they already found their best choice. So they don't kind of reduce the likelihood to move across the region. Within the region, they are more likely to work in the regional sector with comparative advantage. So that's why every sec the sectors trade, you no, know, the regions trade a lot with each other. And of course they can trade with the rest of the world. And then if we just reduce trade cost, you see between occupation, mobility actually reduced a little bit. Um, because so basically the, the RCA sectors in every region is kind of reinforced. And then if your father uh, works in that occupation and sector, you want to stay in the same occupation as your, your parents. And the immigration reform, it does, it increased a lot for the between region mobility. But if we look at the conditional probability of, so if you move across a region already, uh, the likelihood of changing an occupation uh, doesn't increase. And let me see, this is like less than, yeah, doesn't increase uh, a lot as we expected. It's like um, still a lot of the cross-regional immigration, um, they stay in the same occupation as their parents. And then trade and immigration reform, we get something in between. So I'm a bit confused here. There's kind of, you got two potential channels through which you can get occupational mobility. One is by playing around with the skill distribution. So these TIJs. <laughs> And the other mm -hmm. is you've got this barrier, which you make this barrier, you know, be a barrier simultaneously to moving across regions and to moving across sectors. It's like it's not split up. Um, so I could think of, you know, increasing occupational mobility either by mucking around in some way with the skill distribution. Mm -hmm. I don't know what what policy, you know, would do that. But I can sort of sort of see how policies might sort of affect uh, mobility across regions. And then potentially there could be barriers to mobility across occupations, which might be to do with, again, you know, costs of, of skill acquisition. Um, so it's just, there's like two things there in this occupational mobility where you're mm -hmm. putting it all on one thing, right? Just don't really see how policy mm -hmm. is gonna oh, yeah. do what, so, it, what the exercise that you put in. Yeah, you're right, we can't, can't really separate up like this. They are together. You could change your model and make them different. <laughs> okay, um, I know. So at the beginning, so we was kind of, I think the original assumption was like, there is a mu ij and then time mu nm. So we can separate the occupational or the regional immigration cost. But then that gives us a very bad fit of this PIJ, um, this immigration probability across region and occupation. So it seems there are a lot of, uh, still a lot of variations at this kind of four dimensional scale instead of just two separate two dimensional elements. We can, I don't know if we can do that, but the fit, the model fit is very bad. And then, okay, so this, is, so this is kind of immigration flow and trade flow. So if we look at the inequality, so education reform actually increased 
you see it increases total inequality. So um, we were kind of shocked at the beginning. And then if we think about it, it's then it's kind of, it kind of makes sense because then every region's comparative advantage sector, their RCA sector, they can gain as many workers as they want because workers are kind of indifferent between occupations. They're going to flow to the occupation, whichever occupation that pays them higher, the highest wage. And within the region is, you don't have to pay the immigration costs. So then that means every region can kind of um, increase their RCA sector as much as they want. So that's why um, eventually the driving force of income differences become the productivity differences across regions. And, and the immigration reform gives us the smallest inequality measure. So if we do want to reduce inequality, immigration reform is the best choice. Um, so yeah, and so in, in reality, we have trade and immigration reform at the same time. So, so this is some, something in between the inequality measures. So I think the, the most unexpected is the education reform because all the governments who, because um, in Korea, they had the same thing. Like in 1980s, the government banned all the after-school academic training programs. And Japanese government, they kind of, um, they legally require um, teachers in public schools to, to rotate across, um, across all the entire uh, re Japanese regions not just within the province or city, they have to rotate across the country to generate uh, an exante um, e uh, equal education resource uh, to Japanese kids. But, but we see those efforts, um, actually they are not, those effort alone is not going to reduce inequality. Okay, I guess um, my time is up. So to conclude, so the our model combine combines HHJK Roy model with um, trade model to study um, occupational mobility and inequality in the open economy framework. So we find that this education reform um, uh, cannot, cannot reduce inequality, although it uh, gives us the largest welfare gain. Um, and then as expected, trade liberalization increases inequality and uh, reduces um, uh, occupational and regional mobility. Mm, immigration reform, uh, it is the best to reduce inequality. However, it, we cannot, it cannot increase occupational mobility substantially as expected. So the, so the best one is to combine trade liberalization with immigration reform together. Okay, thank you for your comments. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll take any more questions or comments if there are any. Just go ahead and unmute, and jump in. Yeah, this is how we. Yeah. So, so April, I, I I was just wondering if if there was like a an actual like factual experiment you could do that was you know looking at say like um, two periods in time where it's pretty clear like where the policy change was and because um, here like everything is off. It, it, it just would be nice to kind of line it up with with something that actually happened and sort of see if you can back out like do a little bit of accounting of the changes of inequality education and trade and how it affected like mobility uh, all the different things right? you have sort of a 
fun moment you're looking at, but it's the model and it can sort of speak to like changes and, and if you could line it up mm -hmm. in some way. I don't know exactly what the experiment is, but it, it would be nice to, to kind of look at it that way. Okay, you, you want to see which, which reform accounts for how many percent of the change in inequality and those things? Yeah, yeah, okay. you know, like something that kind of happened. Um, Oh, I see. Like a factual. <laughs> but then we, we, need, hard, right? but we need another round of this population census data. Oh, they only had one of them and that's it? Yeah, I think uh, the other data are available is only the, um, the population census. And I think also the, um, yeah, we need the regional trade data okay. to be updated. I think I talked about this with Yanhua. Yeah, I think in the future, yeah, if those data are available. Mm. All right, go ahead and turn off the recording, Marcos or whoever's recording today.